the morning after the night before. Uh, good morning. I hope everyone is well and enjoyed uh, yesterday, uh, yesterday's conference and yesterday evening. Um, so the last thing you need is um, me telling you what I think we should all do, but I'm going to. So uh, I hope you enjoy it. Um, inspired by the, the theme of this conference, I'd like to reflect upon how or even if uh, we as designers uh, care about the experience of future generations when it comes to what we design. We all know that the best bridges are so associated so positively with their uh, location and its cultural identity that the world is unimaginable without them. We all recognize the historic old bridge in Mostar which was destroyed so gratuitously in the Bosnian War of the 1990s, and then painstakingly and accurately rebuilt as a symbol of both survival and renewal. Um, sadly, I think the same thing will have to happen in Ukraine. Such harmony with a place and its people should not be taken for granted and requires skilled design from the earliest stage, because what we build now defines us as a society now and for future generations. This is especially true of transport infrastructure, whose benefits to society can be so far reaching and whose networks and places shape our everyday lives. As this image of our, our, our footbridge in Karahe in Rwanda, uh, part of the Bridges to Prosperity program, uh, illustrates so well, this doesn't have to mean big or grand or iconic uh, or special or architectural, but it has to be useful and it has to be in harmony with the landscape and valued by its people. Yet too many bridges fail to properly acknowledge both the place they are built and the permanent change they are causing to that place. This was an award-winning bridge on the outskirts of Oxford in the, uh, in the UK, completed in 2008. It was a road-widening project that carries the A34 over the A40, and over the Grand Union Canal and the London to Birmingham Railway Line, all within the beautiful Thames Valley. Thousands of people experience this every day. But in focusing on simplifying construction, reducing program, minimizing disruption to highway users during construction and cutting cost, the design completely fails to respect the place it is built and it ignores the people who will experience it thereafter. Um, this disharmonious design is going to be experienced uh, for forever. The structure doesn't even care whether it stands inside or outside the field. Yet this damaging example is far more common than good examples. In fact, it's the norm. Now, of course, poor judgment is just as applicable to architects as it is to engineers, where the desire for the extraordinary the iconic, the outrageous, is no longer justified or acceptable, um, even if it ever was. And it's equally careless. But I'd speculate there are a hundred poor engineering designs conceived and built without proper care for every one of these overambitious architectural follies. Yet these are the easy target, often used to justify the default conservative thoughtless approach. When it comes to our attitude to future generations, this lack of care speaks just as loudly and bad design lasts just as long as a good example does. We have to do better. And as this conference and the people attending represent the absolute best in the field of bridge design, that means us, all of us. When it comes to creating good experiences, now and for the future, it's not enough to be good designers, to enjoy this conference and leave it, we have to be advocates, we have to be ambassadors, agitators for good design. In the last 20 years, the world has changed and looking to the future, the pace of that change will only accelerate. Most obviously, the climate and biodiversity emergency will impact increasingly upon our everyday lives. And there are few who don't recognize the responsibility upon all of us to act and to act now. By far the most powerful three words I heard spoken in the past three years remain those by a 16-year-old in New York in September 2019. How dare you? 
This is a child speaking to every adult in the world. And it seems to me that with respect to sustainability, if we are not part of the solution, then we are a part of the problem. As designers in the field of transport infrastructure, our capacity to make change is far greater than for most people. We have to think and act differently, and that means caring much more about the planet, more about people, and more about design. I expect the future will be most radically defined, not by technology, but by our attitudes to design and the society we serve. Technology, including standardization and automation, will und undoubtedly facilitate this. But we must apply our creative, our leadership and our communication skills intelligently if our quality of life and that of future generations is to be protected. As designers, it is how we behave that will count. So looking at the 17 United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, it might appear to bridge designers that we can only directly influence one. Or perhaps three, if we consider water and sanitation and energy infrastructure alongside transport infrastructure. But how much bigger could our thinking be? For millennia, great infrastructure has been the basis for sustainable cities and communities from which flows the critical components of social sustainability, giving us the means and the momentum towards environmental sustainability, and ultimately bringing economic sustainability. Now, of course, any one of these goals can and should be thought of as the catalyst for such urgent change, but the message must be clear. As designers in the world of infrastructure, we have the ability and the responsibility to shape the future experience positively. And it would be wrong to view this future only through the lens of carbon. Vital though it is, the reduction of our carbon footprint is part of a bigger picture of equity and quality of life. And we must satisfy these broad range of demands. So what are we going to do about it? Uh, at Night Architects, we believe in the power of design to address these demands. Over the, over the years, we realized there are a number of uh, recurring themes in our work uh, that led me to p publish these, these five rules or guides during the COVID lockdown when we were all apart uh, in our studio. They started as catchphrases. Indeed, uh, the first one uh, made an appearance um, at Footbridge 2017 in Berlin as one of the tell a story provocations. <clears throat> but many a true word is spoken in jest and they are helpful reminders of the, uh, of the basics of our trade. Not everyone gets design, and that is why it is so often defined as a short stage in a process, set apart from and following other activities. It is sometimes even a responsibility that is avoided entirely or kicked down the road for the contractor to do. This is dangerous, as design is a creative response that is influenced by everything that comes before it. Great design improves people's lives, it adds value, and it's long-lasting. Design thinking should start at the beginning of a project and continue right to the end, because to achieve great design, timing is everything. But we need to look up from our computer screens too. We need to understand politics, large and small, and finance and economics and procurement if we are to succeed. Much of this is alien or difficult or boring, but it is the environment within which we operate. We need to communicate well with audiences who don't speak our language or who, who don't share our logic. We have to educate our clients and the public so they are part of the change, indeed that they demand it. And that design is valued at the right time and not too late. It is misleadingly straightforward to design a bridge if it's only thought of as a structural challenge or a sculptural form in isolation of a context. And the best bridges address the complexities imposed by their location, where forces flow to ground with visual clarity and the architectural spaces around the bridge are naturally legible and welcoming for users. Lasting value comes when we understand that bridges define our everyday lives, shaping a dynamic network of social interaction and reinforcing a sense of identity. It is the ends which make the bridge. So bridge design is easy. It's the ends which are difficult. And it's vital that bridges contribute to their sense of place as they change the lives of those around forevermore. As was discussed by both Jörg and Andreas yesterday morning, the provision of ramps and a natural, inclusive, a universally inclusive approach is essential. A bridge is incomplete 
if it doesn't fit well with the city or work well for everyone. And as we've learned on many projects, this is frequently not understood by clients or designers, nor allowed for in master plans. This is obviously personal, but you don't, and, and you don't need an architect uh, to, to design a basic bridge, but you do need architectural skill and sensitivity to design a great bridge, one which adds lasting value to a place and serves the people there well. Bridges designed without this uh, skill and care cheat the public who rely upon them thereafter. Applied with care and respect, architect skills are different but complementary to those of engineers. They allow us to consider the user and the context and to bring a vital new perspective to bridge design. Together, we are stronger. And collaboration was one of the strongest messages in last year's Institute of Civil Engineers State of the Nation report to achieve net zero. Yet why are we still so scared of collaboration and inclusion? Is it about prestige or ego or position? Is it co competition or commercial success? Really? I mean, it's 100% clear that we have to be collaborative and open-minded if we're going to succeed. And that means inviting and embracing alternative points of view. The most important tool in engagement are the ears. Um, by way of example or illustration, these are Ove Arup's hand drawings of his Kingsgate Bridge in Durham, his last work, uh, and one which stands as a striking example of his vision for total design, the seamless integration of engineering and architecture. It's very inspiring to see those drawings from uh, the hand of a master. The challenges of form and function often collide in bridge design, where there is no decoration to hide an imbalance. To broker the best deal between form and function, it's, it's essential to switch, se switch seamlessly and constantly between a third person and a first person point of view, the view of and the view from. It is difficult or impossible to see these both at once, yet an intelligent dialogue between the two ensures that the engineering and the aesthetic demands of the bridge form and the needs and sensitivities of the bridge user are combined harmoniously. For both architects and engineers, the view of has predominated in design. How a structure stands in its landscape, the true elevation view, which of course is never truly existing, but is front and center in competition boards. But bridges are more powerful and important than that. They are part of our identity and they invoke strong feelings. So whether a place for a private rendezvous or a public display of support for Ukraine, there is meaning in bridges beyond the everyday. And we should consider the view from, the first-hand user experience, how bridges make us feel every day, just as much as how they look. As bridge designers, our creative approach must ask questions in this specific order. First, why and who, and only then what and how. Meaning, why is this project necessary and who will it affect? Should be fully understood before finding the best answers to what is the design solution and how is it built. The first two questions are open, outward, creative and empathetic, and they lead naturally to the latter two, which are increasingly reductive, inward and focused on delivery. This order ensures the needs of people come first, and after all, we are people designing for people. This is probably the most important rule as well, whether in terms of bridge design or of carbon, and should be obvious. If we don't understand the first two questions, we can't understand, the, we can't understand or we can't answer the latter two. How can we know what to design and how to build if we don't understand completely why we're doing it and who we're doing it for? And if we don't understand this, then how dare we use up other people's carbon and money and resources? How dare we sell short the experience of future generations? How dare we change their world? So if I'm going to talk the talk, um, I'd better try to walk the walk too. Um, so to illustrate the previous points, I offer this uh, recent uh, footbridge example uh, for, for criticism. And I also take my hat off to Dissing and Vitling for beating us in, the, uh, in the, the competition yesterday with this. The location is the River Thames, west of London, uh, not far from Windsor, and the site is a, a triangle of land between the river at the top and the new Jubilee River um, at, the, at the bottom. I say new, it's a, a flood relief channel that is 20 years old. 
The majority of the triangle of land was used for industry, uh, originally the production and later the recycling of paper, and also for the storage of gas. And both of these use, uh, uses ended at the, the start of the 21st century, and the brownfield post-industrial site was earmarked for residential development, with various developers preparing schemes. Importantly, the local community was consulted, uh, and being the architect living in that local community, I saw the opportunity for the residential development to reverse the industrial damage, and I recognised this is a good place to build new homes. It's near to railway stations, it's near to communities, uh, it's easier to integrate into society than to build on a greenfield site. Um, but I also saw the threat that large-scale development, especially in the UK, I suspect, um, can bring to existing communities when they are built in isolation with a gate on the front and they are not part of a, an integrated social mix. Uh, the public is excluded. Uh, and in this case, the access to the, the River Thames path would be um, prevented forever. So we discussed these concerns with the planning authority and developed our own design to illustrate what could be done in this beautiful River Thames setting. The concept design was inspired by the arches of Brunel's nearby Maidenhead Railway Bridge, famously the flattest, widest brick arches in the world. Uh, it was also inspired by the work of several people in this room whose impossibly slender bridges we, uh, we admire very often. We shared these bridges with local people, these pictures rather, with local people, and they made their way to the front page of the local newspaper. All of a sudden, people on both sides of the river became aware of what was coming, and their expectations were raised for a beautiful bridge. The enthusiasm registered with the developer who finally bought the site, and the words, a new footbridge, became an element of their master plan. But the design they proposed of a through truss, painted green to harmonize with the environment, was terrible. Uh, the, the, the 2D elevation drawings that they submitted for planning didn't paint, we felt they, they didn't paint the whole picture. So we made a 3D model to help everyone understand this. <laughs> and mysteriously, this too leaked to the press. Under pressure from the planning authorities on both sides of the river, uh, the developer relented and we were asked to compete for the job and to prepare a design, uh, which we won. And we teamed with our uh, great friends at Covey to develop a solution on a different alignment to that selected by the developer, avoiding the need for ramps, and in, which offered an enjoyable rather than a tortuous route across the Thames. So this is a development of our early optimistically slender concept. The design nevertheless follows the same principles, a flat arch or a flat arc with material lightness, visual transparency and harmony with the setting. It comprises a, a two meter wide steel trough deck suspended from a, a pair of shaped steel arches thrusting against in situ concrete abutments at each bank. The arches were to be painted white to emphasize the superstructure, while a dark gray, RAL 7024, my default for 25 years, uh, was selected for the deck and the, and the parapet to, to maximize visual transparency uh, against the dark green trees that line the, the, this beautiful section of the river. We made a concept model. Uh, this absolutely supports uh, your concept's view of the value of a, a physical model, even a simple one, in communicating design three-dimensionally and truthfully. Um, and we were awarded the job on the basis of the design and of the favourable reaction given to it by the planning authorities and the local people. We used more models to explore critical details, such as the cross-section of the arches. We wanted triangles to achieve a slender and attractive form, but we recognized a rolled hollow section would be cheaper. So we preempted that discussion. We modeled it to demonstrate how it would appear. Um, our good friends at SH Structures um, made a little sample of it. I say little, um, it's probably about 200 kilos of steel there. But, um, and to our surprise, the, the developer fully supported us. 
Having originally been completely disinterested in the bridge design, he was now starting to enjoy the experience. So we demonstrated the design was, was feasible, uh, the detailing worked, uh, and the geometry of these, uh, well, three, one flat, one curved, one conical uh, surface were entirely feasible. We did the same modeling for handrail sections and even the stainless steel uh, joint between the arches and steel plate hangers, which is arguably the only detail on the bridge. My colleague uh, Anna Lara led this project and unfortunately isn't able to attend the conference as she is on maternity leave expecting her second child. Um, however, I think it's fair to say that for her, like, or like for any of us uh, who see our first project come to life in the fabricator's shop uh, here at SH Structures, this bridge was her first baby. The, uh, the bridge structure was transported from Yorkshire to uh, the Riverside location in Taplow in three sections. And it was reassembled onto trestle supports and, and made into a, a single structure. This was the first time that we really felt the decisions about the shape of the arch and the colour scheme were truly vindicated. And I mean, we, we became particularly excited at this point. The bridge was craned onto a barge. It's very useful to have a riverside location to, for, for large cranes um, when access to the, the bridge site was so difficult. And it was sailed upstream uh, on the barge on a day when the river tide was just viable. Uh, this followed several weeks of very, very heavy rain and very powerful flow in the river. Uh, this was a, a, a narrow window of opportunity and very skillfully uh, manoeuvred into position um, and then jacked down onto the bearing locations at, at each end. And the activity took less than a day. Uh, as with all of these things, a huge amount of planning made it look very, very simple. So the final design has become a favorite recreational route. Uh, it reconnects the River Thames path away from highways and it gives a strong sense of place to the new Taplow Riverside community. It's not designed for cycles, but they use it nevertheless, just slowly and politely. And it has become a destination for paddlers and kayakers. It's the start line for a two kilometer open water swim. The view of is now part of the local landmarks and it's raised the profile and footfall to the neighboring pub from where this image is taken. So as we, uh, as we admire slightly jealously uh, all of the context within which your concept uh, gets to build in Switzerland, uh, the, the, the best we can do is to build next to a pub, but life, life isn't all bad. And the view from the bridge or the user experience is comfortable and it's modest. Uh, it provides an open viewpoint from which to uh, enjoy the River Thames. It's transparent in long views, but just using a very simple parapet, it's um, opaque in, in the view looking along the bridge. It gives a sense of enclosure that's reassuring. The, the bridge enthusiasts among us, by which I mean everyone, will appreciate the reward of climbing underneath the deck to see how the geometry of the arches and hangars plays out. I really enjoyed Helena Russell's presentation yesterday um, about how this, the people in this room, we are slightly afflicted that we have to go off piste to look at bridges in strange ways. We see the world slightly differently. We shouldn't ever forget that. Um, so the footbridge was opened by the Right Honourable Theresa May, Member for Parliament of Maidenhead in November 2018, which was four years ago, or as we say in the UK, two prime ministers ago. <laughs> Who, who knew those were the good times? <laughs> so to conclude uh, with this picture of a bridge full of spectators awaiting the release of 3,000 yellow plastic ducks for the annual duck derby, <laughs> all uh, safely recovered by the scouts in their boats over the course of the next day. Um, I think it's vital that bridges contribute positively to their place as they change the lives of those around it forevermore.
the, the privilege and the pressure of participating in the design of this bridge for the community in which I live is one of the biggest lessons of my career. The first-hand experience of what, of what happens after the designer and the builder have completed their task, of how the bridge has changed the daily lives of so many people, uh, not just in their routes and their routines, but in their mode of transport, has been so powerful. The place first shapes the bridge, and thereafter the bridge shapes the place. We have great power, and with that comes great responsibility. And how dare we not respect these two? Muchas gracias. <laughs>